I would remind you if you're following along on your bulletins that uh, there is an outline on the very back of your bulletin minus several key words. The chorus that we just sang, when it's all been said and done, it reads, when it's all been said and done, there's just one thing that matters. Did I do my best to live for truth? Did I live my life for you? When it's all been said and done, all my treasures will mean nothing. Only what I've done for love's reward will stand the test of time. Lord, your mercy is so great, you look beyond my weakness and find purest gold in miry clay, making sinners into saints. I will always sing your praise, here on earth and ever after, for you've shown me heaven's my true home. When it's all been said and done, you're my light when life is gone. What will really matter in the end? What will really matter when we stand before God in eternity and he calls us into account for how we have used our life while we were upon this earth? The Bible is clear. We are going to give an account to God for how we used our life down here on this earth. Just listen to the following verses. Romans 14 verse 12 says, So then each of us will give an account of himself to God. 2 Corinthians 5.10 says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. Hebrews 13.17 tells us that, that church leaders are going to give an account of their leadership unto God. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 3-5 to five, even goes so far as to say that pagans will give an account to him who is ready to judge the living and the dead. There is coming a day when all of us are going to give an account of ourselves unto God. What will really matter in the end? Will it really matter whether we made it to the top of our vocation in life? Will it really matter if we graduated from high school or from college with high honors? Will it really matter if we excelled in sports and even broke world records? Will it really matter if we attain material prosperity and we're able to pass on to our children a hefty inheritance? Will it really matter if we accomplish a reputation of being extremely talented in many of the affairs of life? What will really matter in eternity? In James chapter 1, verses 9 to 12, James tells us two things that will really matter in the end. The first thing that will really matter in the end is shared in James chapter 1 verses 9 to 10. Here we see two kinds of believers. James addresses poor believers in verse 9 and he addresses rich believers in verses 10 and 11. James starts out by giving counsel to poor believers. Please notice me James 1 verse 9. The brother in humble circumstances ought to take pride in his high position. Now, many of the people that James wrote to were very poor. The Greek word that's translated humble means insignificant in the world's eyes. Lowly, poor, powerless, lacking in material possessions. Many of the poor Christians to whom John, John, James wrote this epistle had come to trust, trust in Christ, and as a direct result of their conversion, they were cast out by their families. Many of these Jewish Christians were scattered across Palestine and Syria. They were living in extreme poverty. They would have been ostracized by their Jewish relatives once they became followers of Christ. Many of them would have been disowned by their families. To make things even worse, when, jo when James wrote this epistle, there was a severe famine that had hit that area, according to Acts chapter 11, verses 28 and 29. Many of these poor followers of Christ had lost their businesses. They had given up everything because of their conversion to Christ. Many of these folks were very poor. Please notice with me that James did not tell these poor believers to walk around and complain and gripe about their poverty. 
and about their economic hardships. James did not encourage them to walk around looking like they sucked on grapefruits. <laughs> James <laughs> noticed, James did not want these people to focus upon what they did not have. He wanted them to focus upon what they did have. In this, verse, in this verse, James told these poor followers of Christ to take pride in their high position in Christ. You see, folks, in eternity, it's not going to be the same as what it is here on this earth right now. Hattie Bell put it like this in a little poem. She said, a tent or a cottage, why should I care? They're building a palace for me over there. Though exiled from home, yet still I may sing. All glory to God, I'm a child of the King. James encouraged the believers in Christ that were poor to take pride in their high position in Christ. What is our position in Christ? The New Testament repeatedly speaks of the fact that Christians are united to Christ. He is the shepherd, we are the sheep. He's the bridegroom, the church is the bride. He is the vine, we are the branches. We are intimately connected with Christ. The Radio Bible class published a little summary of our high position in Christ. It said, and I quote, In Christ we have a love that can never be fathomed, a light that can never die, a righteousness that can never be tarnished, a peace that can never be understood, a rest that can never be disturbed, a joy that can never be diminished, a hope that can never be disappointed, a glory that can never be clouded, a light that can never be darkened, a purity that can never be defiled, a beauty that can never be marred, a wisdom that can never be baffled. And these are the resources that can never be exhausted. James wanted these poverty-stricken believers to recognize that, yes, they were poor in their material prosperity, but they were very rich in Christ. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 5 speaks of the Christian's position in Christ. Notice with me, 1 Peter 2, verse 5. You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people belonging to God that will declare the praises of him who called us out of darkness into his wonderful light. If God has allowed a Christian to be poor, he does not want them to dwell upon their poverty. God does not want us to realize to to focus our attention and mope around like we're nobody. If you're a Christian, you're richer than the world's most richest billionaire. You're richer than Bill Gates. We've been delivered from sin's bondage and power and dominion. We've been translated into Christ's coming kingdom. We're a child of the king. We're going to share for eternity in God's riches. 1 Corinthians 3, verses 21 to 23 puts it like this. All things are yours. Whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are in Christ. And Christ is in God. Just as a wife shares all of her husband's riches, and she shares all of her riches with him, in Christ we possess all the riches that God possesses. Now, after James counsels poor believers, he then turns his attention to those who are rich and are blessed with material prosperity. Notice verses 10 and 11 of James 1. But the one who is rich should take pride in his low position because he will pass away like a wild flower. For the sun rises with scorching heat and withers the plant. Its blossoms fall and its beauty is destroyed. In the same way, the rich man will fade away even while he goes about his business. Now, there are some believers, that, uh, the Bible scholars, that believe that James was, reading, was really uh, referring to unbelievers in these verses, but I don't think he was. First of all, it doesn't make any sense that he'd be addressing poor Christians and then switch to talking about unbelievers. But secondly, if James expected rich believers to, to uh, unbelievers to read this letter, he wouldn't want to turn them off right away by writing these kind of things. So what is James really saying to these rich believers in these verses? James is reminding them that they should take comfort in the fact 
that God has spiritually humbled them and has brought them to faith in Christ. Amen. The Bible makes it clear that in comparison to the general population, most rich people are not going to trust in Christ as their Savior. Now, we do see some millionaires and some billionaires that are genuine followers of Christ, but for the vast, vast majority of people, most people are ordinary people that come to embrace the gospel of Christ. Like the rich young ruler who came up to Christ, and Christ told him he, he was trying to justify himself. And Christ told him to give up his riches and come follow him. We're told that he went away sad because he wasn't willing to give it up for Christ. Please notice me, 1 Corinthians 1, verses 26 to 29. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of the world and the despised things and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. God even tells us why. He doesn't bring salvation to many of the rich people because he doesn't want people to be boasting. Mm -hmm. Up in heaven, none of, none of us are going to be walking around strutting like peacocks saying, boy, God, you're really lucky to have me. Mm -hmm. That's so foreign to Christianity. In James chapter 1, verses 10 and 11, James was reminding these rich believers that they need to take pride in the fact that God has saved them in spite of their riches, not because of them. Rich Christians need to understand that they're poor sinners who are saved by grace just like anyone else is. And just like the wildflowers that are growing on the countryside, they and their riches are going to die. James is reminding these rich Christians that their time on this earth is very limited and that they will die just like wildflowers. Now some of us have, wild, have flower gardens in front of our homes. They add a lot of beauty to our to our, our, uh, our homes. In Cindy's flower garden, we have, a, we have bee bombs, lilies, tulips, geraniums, marigolds, pansies, and all kinds of other flowers. But the main problems with a flower garden is that they only last very short. You can have all kinds of flowers blooming one day, and the next day you look and they're all, all the petals have fallen off. They look all ugly. James does not encourage the rich believers to rejoice in their riches. He says rejoice in your salvation in Christ. Amen. They're mortal just like everyone else. But praise God, God is rich in his mercy. Not only to those who are poor, but also to those who are rich. In Deuteronomy 7 verse 6, God told Israel, He said, for you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you out of all the peoples of the earth. To be his people, his treasured possessions. Just like God chose Israel to be his treasured possession, God has chosen to save some rich people in spite of their prosperity, not because of it. The prophet Jeremiah made a similar statement to what James said in the, to the rich in his epistle. Please notice me, Jeremiah 9, verses 23 and 24. This is what the Lord says. Let not the rich man boast of his wisdom. Let not the wise man boast of his wisdom or the strong man boast of his strength or the rich man boast of his riches. But let him who boasts boast about this, that he understands and knows me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness on earth. For in these I delight, declares the Lord. If God allows you to attain Material prosperity in this life. Always remember this great truth. In the end, what really matters is not the amount of money or possessions that we've attained in this life, but whether we have had a relationship with God through faith in Christ. That's what matters. Doesn't matter how much stuff you have. The first thing that really matters in the end is seen in James chapter 1, verses 9 and 11. In the end, what really matters is not the amount of money or possessions that we have attained in this life, but whether we have had a relationship with God through faith in Christ. Amen. 
Poor Christians should not weep over the absence of wealth, nor should rich Christians boast over their wealth. Now, the application of this point is very relevant inside our coronavirus epidemic. There are a lot of followers of Christ, both rich and poor, whose lives are being greatly impacted by this pandemic. Christian businesses are going under just like non-Christian businesses. Christians are struggling to pay their bills just like everyone else. We should not be weeping over the absence of our material prosperity, nor should we be boasting about our material prosperity if God has blessed us that way. What really matters is whether we have a relationship with Christ. If you're here this morning, you've never placed your faith and dependency upon Christ to save you. You need to allow this truth to change your life forever. In the end, what really matters is not how much money we have in the bank, whether we have a relationship with God. And yes, I'm being overly repetitive on this note. Poor Christians should not lament over the over poverty, but they're to rejoice because they are children of God. Rich believers are not to boast over their wealth, but they are to boast over the fact that they have a relationship with God. Rejoice in Christ if you know him this morning. If you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, repent of your sin and trust in him. Let me share one more analogy before leaving this point. I don't enjoy playing the game of Monopoly. How many of you ever play Monopoly? You like Monopoly? I don't like Monopoly for two reasons. Number one, the game seems to go on for eternity. <laughs> the game of Monopoly just goes on and on and on and on and on. You for literally hours, you roll a little dice and then you move a little figure around on the board. But here's the second reason I don't like playing Monopoly, because I never seem to win. I don't think I have ever beat Joshua in the game of Monopoly since, since he was born. He always seems to land on all the expensive places. And then every time I go around the board, my dice always falls so that I land and I owe him. I mean, he's... He just, bankrupts me every time I've played. I, no wonder I don't enjoy playing it. I always, and if I don't roll and land on his property, I always land on the one where it says, okay, you pick up a card. And on my card, it always says, go directly to jail. <laughs> do not pass go. Do not collect $200. I can relate to that one. <laughs> That's bad. The philosophy behind the game of Monopoly is a very dangerous philosophy. The game of, of Monopoly communicates that he or she who ends with the most amount of money and possessions in this life is the winner. Don't kid yourself if you think there are a lot of people in our world today who are living by that philosophy. I'll never forget the one analogy that Dr. James Dobson from Focus on the Family used in his one video. He had just brought about the bankruptcy of all of his family members in the game of Monopoly. After they all walked away in disgust because he had won and they had lost, he was left to put away the game by himself. As he put all the pieces and all the money back into the box, he thought to himself, this game is a lot like life. You go around the streets of life, but in the end, it all goes back into the box. James chapter 1, verses 9 to 11 teaches us, in the end, when you and I stand before the God that created us, the God that created everything inside this world, when we stand before him and give an account, what really matters is not the amount of money and possessions that we owned when we, got upon, when we were on this earth, but whether we had a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. Second thing that will really matter in the end with, is shared with us in James 1, verse 12. It reads, Blessed is the man who perseveres under trials because when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life that God has promised to those who love him. In the end, 
What really matters is whether we have remained true to our love for God in the midst of life's trials. In James chapter 1, verse 12, James tells us of two good things that God has promised to those who remain true in their love for God in the midst of life's trials. The first thing that he promises us is blessing. The word blessed is the same word which is repeated in the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 12. It's that inner quality of joy that God gives us as we stay true to him in the midst of life's trials. Second thing that God has promised to those who have remained true to their love for God, even in the midst of trials, is the crown of life. The Bible speaks of five different crowns that, every believe, that believers can attain. There is the crown of life mentioned here in James 1 and Revelation 2 verse 10, which will be given to all those who have faithfully endured life's trials without losing their love for God. Secondly, there's the incorruptible crown, mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 25 to 27, which is given to those who have run the Christian race well. There's a crown of rejoicing, mentioned in 1 Thessalonians 2, 19 and Philippians 4, 1, which is given to those who have led other people to Christ. There's the crown of glory that's mentioned in 1 Peter 5, verses 1 to 4, which will be given to pastors who have served faithfully in the ministry. And there's the crown of righteousness, which is mentioned in 2 Timothy 4, verses 6 to 8, which will be given to all those who truly love the appearance of Christ. God has promised eternal rewards to all those who have truly lived for him while on this earth. So far from James chapter 1, we've learned a lot of different things about trials. We've seen that when trials come into our life, we need to see them from God's perspective. We're to face trials with joy because God has brought them into our life for a purpose, as Neil pointed out. This coronavirus epidemic, it didn't just happen to come. God has sent it into our world for a purpose. We've seen the trials will come upon us suddenly without warning. They'll take all kinds of shapes and sizes. Some trials will be small. Others will be large and lifelong. We've seen that all of life's trials are sent by God to do three things. Number one, it's going to make us more persevering and patient. Secondly, it's going to mature us, and it's going to make us like Jesus. And now we see in James chapter 1, verse 12, that what really matters in the end is whether we remain true to our love for God in the midst of life's trials. God's told us several times in the Bible what really matters in life. What really matters is will we continue to love God even when trials come into our lives. Please notice me, Matthew chapter 22, verses 35 to 40. An expert in the law tested Jesus with this question. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? Jesus replied, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, and the second is like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now this command for believers to love God is so important that he has repeated it many times in the Bible. Just listen to the following verses. Deuteronomy 6, 5 reads, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, and with all of your strength. Deuteronomy 10, 12 says, And now, O Israel, what does the Lord your God ask of you but to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all of his ways, to love him, to serve the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul? Deuteronomy 11, verse 1 reads, Love the Lord your God and keep his requirements. Deuteronomy 30, verse 16 says, For I command you today to love the Lord your God. Joshua 23, 11 reads, So be very careful to love the Lord your God. Mark 12, verse 30, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. Luke 10, 27 reads, Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all your soul, with all of your strength, with all of your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Amen. What really matters in this life is whether we continue to love God with all of our heart, mind, and soul, even when trials come into our lives. God is going to send all kinds of trials into our life to see if we are going to continue to love him 
with all of our heart, mind, and soul. So every time you and I see a trial come into our life, we need to still love God. We need to see whether we will remain true to Him in the midst of that trial. The crown of life comes from God, and it will be given to all believers who have persevered in life's trials without turning away from their love for God. The word persevere means to remain constant under something. Trials are like a heavy load that God places upon our backs. And we don't like being loaded down with things. But the, to, to the person who stays true to their love for God in the midst of the trials, God has promised the crown of life. Now, as your pastor, I know the, tr the trials that many of you are facing. Some of you are going through some pretty difficult times. I hate to say that. But James chapter 1, verse 2 says, These trials are varied. Some are large, some are small, some are temporary, some are lifelong, some are financial, some are vocational, some are emotional, some are spiritual, some are physical. Life's trials are varied. But what really matters? What really matters is whether we stay true to our love for God in the midst of those trials. In December of this year, I will have been the pastor of this church for 35 years. I've seen many, many people come and go from this church. Many of the people who have attended this church now live in other states in America. I literally could visit people in Florida, Arkansas, Illinois, Maine, Kentucky, New Mexico, New Jersey, North and South Carolina. I probably, and I don't think I've less than near all the states that I could visit people in. But what scares me that I've seen many of the people that have attended this church in the past, are still living in our area. They're no longer even going to church. You can talk to them about God, and they, they got this glaze in their eyes, like they don't even know what they're talking about anymore. I know many of the situations behind why many of these folks have turned their backs on God and upon His church. Many of these folks have stopped loving God in the midst of life's trials. And the scary part about it all, don't think it couldn't happen to you. Please notice me, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 12 to 13. So if you think that you're standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, but God is faithful, and he will not let you to be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you're tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. So how are we to guard ourselves so that we don't turn away from God when life's trials come. Please notice with me Hebrews chapter 10, verses 23 to 25. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we possess, we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds. Let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another. And all the more as you see the day approaching. Notice that holding unswervingly to the faith of the Bible is connected to us encouraging one another. We need the body of Christ. We need one another to help us so that we, when trials do hit, that we don't turn away from our love for God. So what will really matter in the end? What's really going to matter when we stand before God in that great day and he calls us into account for our life when we are upon the earth? In James chapter 1, verses 9 to 12, there we see at least two things that will really, really matter in the end. Number one, in the end, when you and I stand before God and give an account of our lives unto God, what will really matter is not the amount of money and possessions that we have attained in this life but whether we had a relationship with God through faith. Number two, in the end, when we stand before God and give an account of our lives unto him, what's really going to matter is whether we have remained true to our love for God in the midst of life's trials. Everything else in this life is secondary. I'm going to ask everyone to bow their heads and close their eyes. If you're here this morning and you don't have a relationship with God through faith, 
but you'd like to, would you please raise your hand? I'm not going to embarrass anyone. I want to share with you more, though, if you would like to have a relationship with God and understand God's wonderful plan of salvation. Is there anyone here this morning that has never trusted in Christ as their Savior but would like to? Shall we pray? Our precious Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you that you have revealed to us this morning what really matters from the Bible. Pray that each one of us would have a personal love relationship with Christ and that we would be growing in that relationship. I pray that each one of us would remain true to you regardless of the trials that we might face. Lord, we know that you send trials to bring us closer to you. I pray that we'd respond appropriately when those trials come. Thank you, Lord God, for these things. We pray that... In the name of Jesus, amen. amen.